it's Combine Week, that means we're looking at interviews. We've already talked about Robert Sala. Now let's take a look at Joe Douglas's Combine press conference. J-E-T-S, Jets, Jets, Jets! All right, welcome to Jets Talk. My name's Ryan. I'll be your pilot. If you're new here, hit that subscribe button. If you've been here before, welcome back. I love having you here. Boys and girls, I go live Mondays at 8 o'clock for my live call-in show. Make sure you call in and ask all your Jet-related questions. And then Tuesdays, we go live with our Talk and Jets panel, myself, O'Leary, and Greenbean, uh, 8 o'clock on Tuesday. So make sure you tune into that and ask us more Jet-related questions. But let's jump into today's topic, and that is talking about the Combine, specifically the press conferences of Robert Sala and Joe Douglas. I already did my Robert Sala one. I'll link that up here. This one, we're going to take a dive into Joe Douglas and look at all the, the little ins and outs from his press conference for today. So when asked about maintaining financial flexibility, Joe Douglas had this to say. I think we always want to be financially flexible. Uh, we, we, we always want uh, the opportunity to strike if, uh, if, the, if the right opportunity presents itself. So uh, I, I think that is something that we're, we're going to be looking to do moving forward. So that makes a lot of sense. He wants to maintain financial flexibility so we can strike when the iron is hot. You want to be able to bring in guys at a whim's notice. That's why the Bills were able to bring in and make a move for Stefan Diggs. I think the Jets are going to be looking for that type of opportunity as well. And then Joe Douglas goes on. He was asked, what about the potential of drafting a safety inside the top 10? Yeah, no, and I, and I love Coach's answer. And so, you know, I, I, where I've come from, it's you take the best player available. And... Um, had a lot of success being around uh, that that mindset and that philosophy. And so if there is a player, regardless of position, that we feel can come in here and be that type of difference maker, um, yeah, we need to talk about it and uh, have that discussion. And uh, at the end of the day, we're going to bring in the player that, that we feel is the best fit for the Jets, not only as a player, but as a person, competitor, character fit. All right, so clearly everyone knows we're talking about Kyle Hamilton here. There's no other safety in this draft that is really going to go remotely high, like maybe back end of the first round with Brisker or something like that. But Hamilton in the top 10 specifically, probably at four, is what Jet fans are kind of either for or kind of a little bit uh, afraid of. <laughs> so I don't know where you stand on it, but Joe Douglas, if he deems that Kyle Hamilton is one of the best players in the draft, he will make the selection as best player available because he has had success across his career doing that at Baltimore. They did it in Philly. So obviously it's a, a good route to take. Um, now, whether or not you, you're on board with taking his safety is entirely different, but it's going to be impressive to see their, uh, their evaluation process as this goes on. But I do think this means he's squarely on the table. Maybe that's a play to, to try and get the Texans not to trade back or something along those lines. But either way, I'm uh, I'm eh on this. <laughs> I don't necessarily love it, but I'm eh. Uh, and then we, we we bring up Quinn and Williams' extension. Joe Douglas said this. Yeah, you know, I um, had, a, had a good opportunity to get with Nicole at the, uh, at the Combine. Had a productive conversation with her. Um, you know, as of right now, um, look, we, we, we are going to pick up Quinnen's option. Um, and, and we had that conversation. I don't think that's really uh, huge news, but uh, we are going to pick up that option uh, moving forward. And, uh, you know, look, we're, we're excited to have Quinn in. Um, this is, this is going to be year two in a defense that we feel really accentuates his, uh, his strengths, his positives, and, you know, look, looking forward to him for him to, you know, come back and, and dominate this offseason and have a great year. All right, so Quinn's fifth-year option, Obviously, uh, we're going to make that that decision. It's it's not a huge breaking news. You, you draft a guy in the uh, you know the third slot overall. You want to ideally hold on to him. And Quinn, Quinn has shown enough promise to to really hold on to him for quite a bit of time. Um, but you want to see that next step. We were hoping we'd see that next step this past year with Vinnie Curry and Carl Lawson on the line helping him out. But you wind up losing both your edge rushers. You kind of have to take a year back in your evaluation of Quinn and Williams. But I think the star that is Quinn is definitely trending up. And I think it's absolutely critical that we hold on to him for his fifth year option. Now per over the cap, I believe that's about a 10 point something, uh, 10.3, I think million dollar fifth year option. So really not a whole heck of a lot. And spot track actually has Quinn and Williams multi-year extension, um, projection to be around 17, 17 and a half million dollars a year on a multi-year deal, which is crazy. You better start getting some more sacks, Quinn, in, in the next year or two. But I'm glad that they're keeping this dialogue open. And I think it is important to hold on to Quinn because he has been a really good uh, piece to this team. Uh, he was asked about getting weapons for Zach Wilson. 
you know, in terms of developing Zach, and I'm going to piggyback a little bit what Robert said today. I think there's a lot of ways that we can we can help our young quarterback, and um, I think you saw it this year. I think uh, you know when when a young quarterback's playing with a 14 point lead versus uh, trying to come back from a 14 point deficit, you know, if we can if we can put uh, pieces around him to make sure that he has a lead instead of playing from behind, young quarterbacks are going to be uh, in better position to succeed. So. You know, obviously, uh, one avenue to, to help the quarterback is playmakers, right? It's uh, it's the weapons, it's the uh, it's the wide receivers, it's the tight ends, it's the backs. But there's there's also the other ways to help it, which is uh, you know a, a good solid defense to to get him the ball back as often as he can. All right, so everyone's all excited. We want to take weapons. We want wide receiver in free agency. We want a wide receiver in the draft. We want a tight end in free agency. We want a tight end in the draft. We want to just surround Zach so he has no excuses whatsoever of having a bad season or not hitting his full potential. Uh, we don't want to have those same issues that we had with Sanchez, with Gino, with Sam. Try to eliminate that entirely. But it's not necessarily wide receiver tight end. It could also be seen on the defensive side of the ball. This is something that Robert Sala said earlier in today's uh, interview, that if you prevent the other team from scoring so many points, you're not playing with a 14-point deficit, you're going to have the ability to dictate plays a little bit better as opposed to playing from uh, you know, a losing position. Uh, and not to mention, the defense on the other side of the ball can just tee off on your quarterback because you're going to have to start to work away from the run a little bit, especially as you get later into games. So I think defense is squarely open at the beginning part of this draft, and it would not shock me at all if you do see a double dip on defense maybe edge and corner or something along those lines uh, at the premium position. So it's going to be interesting to see how they how they kind of handle that. Uh, Joe Douglas was then asked about adding veteran players versus drafting players and how that could impact Zach Wilson's development. Yeah, no, the, those are those are discussions that, that we have to have. And so you know, obviously when you're watching a pro player, you're it's it's apples to apples. You're watching him go against the best players in, in, in the world uh, versus a college player where you're seeing him playing against um, guys that may not be playing on Sunday. So, um, you know, pro scouting gives you that opportunity where you're really seeing them, uh, like I said, apples to apples. So um, there, there is a little bit more certainty when you're talking about the pro player market versus the draft market. And so I, th I think that's why you see, uh, you know, volatility in the draft. But, you know, again, like I said earlier, you know, if the right opportunity presents itself, uh, in the trade market, we're, we're ready to strike. So this is a conversation that we've been having as fans uh, across the board. Do you go out and you try to sign a, a big free agent or trade for a big uh, you know, wide receiver prospect that's a veteran, a proven guy in this league, or do you go and you draft arguably the top wide receiver in this class at number 10? There's not too many wide receivers, you know, maybe Atlanta at number eight if they trade Calvin Ridley. Um, but more than likely, the Jets are going to have their choice of a, a few really good wide receivers. And there's benefits and there, there's pros and cons. Robert Sala earlier in the day said that, you know, guys like Debo Samuel, you know, he's a great player, but it took him three years to, to kind of find that footing. It just, you know, a little bit of time. And do you want to risk maybe having uh, Zach have to wait for that type of development or do you go with the proven prospect? And I've always kind of been on the side of the proven prospect. I'd prefer to trade one of our second round picks for a proven wide receiver, someone like an Amari Cooper, uh, you know, insert whatever other names you want in there. But I do think that uh, going the proven route will at least help Zach immediately while still giving us that, you know, little bit of flexibility. Because we don't know if Corey Davis is going to be here beyond next season. He's, we really gave him a two-year deal with a third-year team option. Um, so signing a receiver in free agency or trading for one doesn't necessarily create a crowded room. Uh, and it also probably depends on what you do with Barrios too. You want to don't spend too much money. If you spend a lot of money on Barrios, maybe you don't wind up bringing in an additional free agent wide receiver. You wind up going the draft purely financial reason wise. Um, then he was asked about the offensive line and here's what Joe Douglas had to say about that. I think our offensive line is, is in a better place now. Um, I think, uh, you know, if you ask me, I'm I'm always going to say we can we can be better uh, on the offensive line. But I thought we had a group of guys that battled their butts off this year. I think we have a lot of versatility in that group, and a lot of a lot of good people, a lot of great great guys, great pros, and again, guys that have have been forced to move different positions in season, in game. So uh, their flexibility, their versatility. It's really, it's really been a great tool for us moving forward. But uh, like, like Coach and I have always said, uh, offensive and defensive line is always going to be a priority here. So the offensive line is in a better place. 
this is interesting because I don't know whether to believe, okay, well, I do believe that we are in a better place. I think this line significantly better than two years ago's line. Absolutely, no questions asked. But I do want to wonder like how much we should be reading into this or not because everything's going to be a smoke screen this time of year. So him hyping up, you know, best player available in the draft while maybe downplaying offensive line, maybe that is a tip of the hand. Maybe he does like an Aquanu or a Neil or maybe he's being... Totally honest, and, and you know, maybe it's not quite as high of a priority. We did see Daniel Jeremiah come out and say there's plenty of ways to build an offensive line without using first-round picks, and ideally, that's how you would like to do it. You don't want to spend all your first-round picks on the offensive line because you're going to have to pay a ton of money to one position group. So spread out the love. Go across all the different position groups with this. I like it. I think it makes sense. He did preach a lot of versatility. So I would say when you're looking at offensive line, guys like a Neal, an Aquanu, a Kenyon Green... Uh, Zion Johnson, guys that have positional flexibility on that offensive line, those guys will be a priority. So keep an eye on them for sure. And he closes that whole statement out with, of course, here with Robert and him, offensive and defensive lines are going to be a priority here in New York. So I think it's it's easy to see with Sal and his success with the edge rushers and Joe Douglas and his history with the offensive line. It just makes a ton of sense that that's where we're going to focus some assets. Uh, he was asked about trading in the NFL draft, something that we have not been shy of doing either up or down and here is what he had to say about that yeah look we're always open for business um i think in the last two drafts um had experience going back and coming up and so um look if if again if the opportunity is right um you know we're, we're gonna look at uh we're, we're gonna look at every opportunity as it comes and so if the, if there's an opportunity to trade back accumulate more more uh, more picks, more assets, and still be in target range to get the players that we're excited about, of course we're going to consider that. Oh, I love draft day trades. It gets me all sorts of excited because there's just so much, uh, like you can't predict it. Like with a mock draft, you can kind of see like down the line, like, okay, this is where this guy's probably going to go, and then this one, and then this one. But with a trade, it throws a whole wrench into the situation, and I absolutely love it because Joe Douglas has taken advantage of all the other GMs in the league, and he has managed to use his assets in a really, really efficient and effective manner. So we traded up for AVT last year. We traded down to get Denzel Mims the year before. We're going to be wheeling, de wheeling and dealing up and down, but we are open for business, and I really like this. you got to keep the, the phone available, close to you. I would look to trade down from 10. I would look to trade up from the second round. Those are probably the two spots, ideally, where I would like to be to get some, some blue-chip talent or, or top-end talent uh, for our team. So that's what I would like to see. Joe Douglas was then asked what he thought about Michael Carter. Oh, man, uh, I mean, young MC's the dude. He's, uh, you know, the, the evaluation on him, um, unbelievable contact balance, uh, great feet, lateral agility. Uh, he's a weapon out of the backfield uh, in the passing game, really good hands. One of the more elusive running backs coming out in the draft last year. Um, in terms of optimal uh, carries, touches, you know, I think that's dictated on a game-by-game -game basis by our staff, um, and you know, I think I think this offense has had a lot of success uh, with a uh, with a really strong rotation. But um, we we, we love we love Michael. Ugh, I don't have to spend much time on this. I love me some Michael Carter. I was I grew up as like a big Curtis Martin fan and loving the running back. I love Thomas Jones, Leon Washington. You know, all the guys from across you know my childhood growing up that wore green and white. And Michael Carter is no exception. This guy has elusive feet. He's great out of the backfield. He's just a jack of all trades. He's absolutely awesome. I do think Joe Douglas wants to see a, a running back by committee. I don't think they want to run Carter into the ground too hard. And I think they'll they'll be looking to split carry. Similarly to how we saw this past year, whoever plays the best matchup, that's what you do. Obviously, you would like to to kind of err on the side of Carter because of all that talent. But again, you don't want to you know beat him into the ground. Uh, the question about Denzel Mims did come up, and this is what Joe Douglas had to say about Mr. Mims. No, I wouldn't say that at all. I'd say with Denzel, uh, obviously documented um, last year with, with uh, the, his bouts with sickness um, and some injuries. Um, but I, I know Denzel's attacking this, this, this offseason. Um, I know he's in great shape. I've, I've had great conversations with his agent. I know he's working his tail off, and I know he's excited to get back here for OTAs and, and compete with the rest of his teammates. All right, I'm not sure how to feel about this. Like, is he, is he genuinely you know, talking positively about Denzel Mims. I think he's never going to say negative things about any player. So you're always going to hear the positive side of things. 
but the body language of the coaching staff at the end of the year with Denzel Mims just looked awful, and the way they utilize him was horrible. So if they still believe that he could be a guy long-term here, that is absolutely awesome for me. I do want to hear that, because the guy's got talent out the wazoo, but I just find it hard to believe that after everything I saw and the way we utilized him this year, it just doesn't seem like a fit. So this might be a little bit of him fluffing it up and maybe trying to... Uh, create some type of trade conversation at some point if we feel like, hey, we had an opportunity to sign or draft a free agent uh, wide receiver or draft a wide receiver, and now we're looking to possibly move on from Mims, but he's a good player, so don't worry about it. You can give us a pick back. I like it. I think it's a good move either way. I would love to see Denzel Mims back. I just don't know if I'd necessarily see that. Uh, and then going into one of our biggest free agents of the offseason, that's Braxton Barrios. Here's what Joe Douglas had to say about him. Braxton, you know, again... Um had some good conversations w w with uh, with um, his his representation, Drew, and and uh, you know we're gonna have have more conversations. And so obviously Braxton has been awesome since we we brought him in, and uh, he's an asset to this team. And uh, you know for us it's it's going to be it's uh, it's important you know to um, to to keep to keep the guys that that do things the right way and uh, carry themselves the right way. The key part to this whole answer. I think, is the keep guys around that are doing the right things. That, to me, means the world. And it's something that I've always said about retaining free agents. I would rather pay a little bit more for our own guys because we know they work in our system, they've done things the way our coaching staff wants them to do them, and then you can see from within, when you're building from within the draft, like our regime wants to do, you are going to have guys see the guys ahead of them, get contracts, do the right thing, and you're going to have other guys fall in line. And that is important. When you wind up going out in free agency and you're spending a ton of money on, on you know, Le'Veon Bell or C.J. Mosley, and I'm victim of it. I love getting the big name because it gets me all sorts of excited. But when you do that, you have this conflict of, of contract. It's like, hey, we're willing to go out and spend damn near $20 million a year to get Tremaine Johnson, but we're not willing to give any money to the guys in-house. Like that, that, to me, is a very, very bad look for your team. I think it puts you in a negative spotlight, and I think it sets you up for having to give massive contracts to your own guys because you're setting a standard for guys that are coming in that haven't been proven in your system with your coaching staff, the way guys inside your team do. That's kind of why I would like to retain Barrios. I would like to retain Foley Fatukasi, even though, you know, I understand if he winds up getting a little bit too much, but I, I, I like this interview from Joe Douglas. I think we got to see a lot of things. I think defense is squarely on the table early in this draft. I do think there's going to be a ton of options at wide receiver, whether it be through trade, free agency, or the draft. I don't think anything is really set in stone, but we do know that Joe Douglas is looking for guys with character, guys with a lot of heart, and guys that could really help this team in the long run, get some blue chippers, some big-time talent with best player available if we can. So guys, let me know your thoughts down below in the comments. What did you think of Joe Douglas's press conference? What did you think of Robert Sal's press conference? Can we take anything away from it? Let me know in the comment section down below. And as always, go Jets. Yeah!